So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, August the 25th, and this is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 221. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is the way to be. I'm really glad that you're here. Today we're talking about topics that were submitted in the form of questions over the past week. So, a lot going on. Heavy storms came through last night, so there's dynamic weather all over the United States. And some people are still roasting. Other people are overloaded with rain. And right here where I am, what's the weather doing? 70 degrees Fahrenheit right now. In fact, the air is so heavy and on the fringe of raining that there is a fog in the air that actually feels like little rain. I think if you look at METARS, which are meteorological reports, they refer to it as BBR. Do you know what that stands for? Baby rain. I think that's interesting. So fog is just baby rain, little tiny spits. So it's 99% relative humidity. How much dehumidification do you think is happening inside the beehives right now? Almost none. So as you saw in the opening sequences, bees are clustered on the outside of the hive. They're just getting wet and they're really having a tough time drying out what's going on inside. But there is good news coming over the weekend. In fact, Saturday, if you're anywhere near me, northwestern Pennsylvania, northeastern United States, uh, Saturday is probably going to be your best beekeeping day, although Sunday is not too far behind it. Saturday has the warmest, mostly sunny, and then things are going to go bad on Wednesday. That's right. Temperatures are going to drop into the 60s. We don't like that. But uh, so anyway, what else? Wind speed, one mile an hour. It's like nothing. It's really nice to be outside. And uh, what else? We keep finding bees in, of all species, not just the honeybee, which is Apis mellifera. We're talking about Bombus, so the bumblebees, Melissodes, which are on the sunflowers, they're just hunkered down and sitting there looking wet and miserable. So of course it puts a dent in their foraging. And uh, what else is coming on? That's pretty much it for the weather and everything. If you want to know what we're going to talk about today, please look down in the video description. All the topics are listed in order. If you want to submit a topic for consideration of your own, then please follow the link, which is also in the video description, and it takes you to my website, which is thewaytobe.org. And there um, you can fill out a form on the page marked The Way to Be. This is also a podcast, so if you're busy, if you're on the fly, and you just want to hear what's being said, then, of course, Podbean, The Way to Be. Or you can just Google The Way to Be podcast, and you'll find it because it's on a whole bunch of different podcast uh, programs. So what else do we have going on to do, 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 do? I guess we can just about jump right in. So question number one comes from David, and this is his YouTube channel name, at David Cress 806 it says, one question, I have the rapid rounds, so I plan on using them this winter with sugar. Okay. And I noticed that the one you showed seems to have holes in the outer and inner covers. Did you drill those holes? Okay, Joe, just so you know what we're talking about, this is it, and these are the holes. See, I'm right in the middle there. And it's interesting because the holes in this outer clear cover correspond to holes in the inner clear cover. Why did they do that? Same number of holes, by the way. So if you turn it a certain way, then of course they line up and you get venting through everything. If you turn it anything other than lining up the holes, then it stops air from flowing through. So if you're unfamiliar with a rapid round feeder, it sits on top of your inner cover directly over the hole that goes through your inner cover. And uh, you have the option to feed dry feed or syrup. When it's in the syrup mode, then you put this clear cover on and this just prevents your bees from getting out into the syrup and drowning, of course. Winter time, this comes out. The outer cover goes on. And now we have a dry feeder. Okay, so sugar is what we're talking about right now. So the question is, these holes, did I drill them? No, did not. They came with it. I don't even know what company this is, but they're the only ones I think that sell the yellow version. Most of the rapid rounds are white. And this is a little smaller in diameter, so it can fit under smaller roof systems and things like that if you don't have a really good thick feeder shim, about two inches in thickness on the height. And if you look at the bottom, there's a center cone that slightly goes below the bottom of this, and that's designed to go into the inner cover. If that doesn't fit, you can put just a gasket from one of your mason jars 
uh, right underneath of it and that gives it a little standoff and seals it there and then lets that little um, center cone part go flush with the inner cover. So the other thing is, do I want them and do I care about them and do I need the venting through the top? I don't, I don't even like it. So the reason is that in the winter time, and there's very good information on this, by the way, these aren't just, you know, opinions. Uh, this is research that was done by Dr. Seeley, Thomas Seeley from Cornell University. He's a behaviorist and entomology, and he does all this fantastic research, and he is like a household name in beekeeping when it comes to really significant research on animal behavior. So we talked a lot about moisture and the benefits of it inside the hive, how the bees use it, summer, winter, heat stress, and in the cold, of course, uh, when a lot of people are thinking that they should vent through the top of their hives, this is something that really divides beekeepers, and you can go either way. I'm just letting you know what my source of information is, and it's also worked out for me here in Pennsylvania in the snow belt. So we don't uh, vent through the top. Now, what can you do about that? If yours happens to have those holes, you can just use um, cellophane tape on the top of it and block them up. Or you can put my favorite insulation double bubble right over the top and seal that up. See, the bees don't have access to that during the year, so they're not able to let you know if they want to seal that vent up or not. And this happens a lot. When it comes to the configuration changes this time of year, a lot of people shift around and change the venting, and some people put you know, quilt boards and things like that. They'll stick a bunch of pine shavings up in there. They'll wrap a bunch of burlap up there. So they're making a bunch of modifications to the top of their top of their hive just before we go into winter. And uh, the thing of that is, if it's good insulation, leave it on summer and winter, it shouldn't be changed. And one of the drawbacks to changing that just as the weather gets cold is that you'll never know what your bees wanted to do with it because when it's cold, they can't develop that propolis envelope the way they'd like to. So this is why my configurations are the same, summer and winter, no difference. So I don't uh, have the venting through the top of that. So should you add venting or do you feel that leaving it without holes would actually help in moisture? It does help with moisture and this uh, has played out with studies that have been done on the interior hive microclimate. So those who wanna think inside the box uh, that's where you will understand that even in the wintertime, they are desperate for water and we need condensation to form inside the hive. Where it should not form is directly over your bees. Sidewalls are best. So anyway, I uh, live about two hours south of you, so conditions are similar other than I'm not really in the snow belt. So two hours south of me, that could be Pittsburgh. Um, anyway, that's the answer to that. No, I don't like the holes, don't need the holes, but the option's there. So if you're a manufacturer, I guess it makes sense to include that just in case somebody might think that they need venting through the top of their hive. Question number two comes in from Tim, Millersburg, Ohio. Soon I'll have access to high-speed Wi-Fi on the farm where I keep my bees. And what are some of the first tech tools that you would install to gain info from your bees. Scales, sensors, etc. Also, ideas on how to extend Wi-Fi to the bee yard. Okay, so here's the thing. Now where I live, uh, my bees are close by. They're very close to where I'm sitting right now. In fact, they're about 100 feet away from me. So Wi-Fi is an issue for a lot of people in rural parts of the country. It has been for me historically. Do you know I used to spend over $300 a month just for internet? because they put data caps on everything that we do. So I had to have multiple accounts and I won't name the companies, but they had these dishes that they put on your roof and they tell you that you have unlimited internet use. But what really happened was after you hit a certain threshold, they throttled you back to where you had about 10% of the, of the rated performance. And then they use clever terms like we provide up to three megabytes per second or megabits per second. I don't know. I'm not a tech guy. But thank goodness now because they had funding. Armstrong came through and we have fiber optics where I live, so I'm super happy. So now all that's left, which is why I don't have to drive every Friday to the town north of me and sit in a driveway for an hour and a half to two hours while my Q&A uploads. I know you care about all this. It's very interesting. But now I get to just be here. 
So B here, get it? Anyway, so now that I have this fiber optic network from Armstrong, um, extending the network out to the B yard was not hard. So that's the question here. If you want to have some of these systems on the BR that report data, you need a Wi-Fi connection. So where I am, the other thing is uh, where you're locating your Wi-Fi router, your main router. That's your initial signal, of course. And then uh, I did a little look. See, so I'm going to mention this right away, by the way, because I did a little, did a little check on this stuff. I already have my Wi-Fi extenders out here, and I put them at 30-foot intervals. And now I have high-speed internet, more than six megs per second, even in my Way to Be Academy building. So I could actually live stream out there if people would stop shooting their guns and blowing up Tannerite and things like that. That's another story. But uh, so uh, you can get these, but here's the thing I want to tell you right now. Look at something called, and it's an American company, Extend Tech, E-X-T-E-N-D-T-E. CC. And the reason I bring it up right now is I checked several forums that talked about data and Wi-Fi extensions and things like that. This was the number one system. It's half off today. This has nothing to do with me. I don't even have their stuff. This is just based on my reading. That router is normally $119 and today it's $59.99. So you can, yeah, I won't feel bad at all if you ditch this video and you go check that out if you're in the country and you have a need to extend your wi-fi save 50 percent. the normal price is 119.99 even that's probably not bad but i just have the armstrong extenders they're hexagonal and you plug them into different outlets and i did find some interesting stuff out about that i know this is a b channel but a lot of beekeepers need to have an extended range to their wi-fi so these little hexagonal things you plug them in and i thought I got a really strong aftermarket Wi-Fi system, but if you're on a Windows system, which I am, I'm not an Apple guy, even though I do cinema and photography and all of that, but it kept popping up that I had a warning that there were duplicate IP addresses in my network. In other words, it was warning me because it thinks that something is impersonating another piece of equipment. What it really was is that I had my Wi-Fi and then, of course, when you have an extender, it has the same ID as the Wi-Fi. But this is why I looked it up, because I thought, what is the problem? Why should it be 30 feet away from your Wi-Fi? Well, the reason it has to be 30 feet away is because if it's too close to your actual router, you get what that warning was, which is two identical systems are showing up on your network. And I thought it was a Windows glitch or something like that. But what it really was is I needed to extend the extender to 30 feet minimum from the router. So then I didn't get that duplicate signal. I mean, again, you're a beekeeper, you're probably leaving the channel right now because we're talking about Wi-Fi extenders, but I'm just explaining these are the things that I had going on. So then uh, I plugged one into the garage and then I plugged another one into the outbuilding and now I have fast internet. I could sit in the bee yard and live stream if I wanted to now. So they do work, and I think they all work. They just, some work a lot better, and that particular one I mentioned was better. Uh, the other thing is, what kind of tech do I put in the beehives? I've changed that a lot through the years. I bought a bunch of broodminders. I wanted to know temp and humidity, and then I only wanted to know temp. And then I realized that uh, I don't need it to be accurate. Uh, Penn State University bought a whole bunch of broodminders and uh, they were using them, of course, to you know to monitor all of their beehives, and they each have their own code. It's got a little sticker that sticks out that tells you which unit it is, and of course, you have to use your cell phone. Then you get all this great data. Here's what I wanted to know, and so the reason I'm mentioning it is you may be overdoing it in how much information you think you need about what's going on inside your hive, because what do I want to know in winter time? I want to know if my bees are alive, or if they're dead, and I want to know where they are in the hive. So this is the tech I use. Broodminders, don't use them anymore. Um, and that's not because they don't work, it's just the data, by the way, does fluctuate quite a bit based on the people that shared their data with me. They get very inconsistent readings. Um, there are also scales that you can put on your hives that indicate, of course, um, the weight of the hive. So when you're taking on honey or you might be producing a lot of brood and even the weight of the bees is increasing in a hive, 
that's interesting data. But there again, I had to realize that I don't really need that information. So now I have humidity, which uh, is interesting to me because I noticed that it hangs around 65% relative humidity in the hives that have live bees in them. And uh, through winter time this is what I'm talking about. And then of course, uh, any temperature above the outside temperature would let me know that something's alive in there. Honeybees individually are cold blooded animals, but when they're clustered together as a superorganism, they behave as a climate controlling, warm blooded superorganism. Okay, because they're a social insect, so they act more as, so you look at individual bees as cells in a larger organism rather than the individual bee that could never survive on its own and they're social, so they cluster together. So getting this information, the other thing is I, the tech that I use is infrared. So I use infrared scans. Um, I used to use the FLIR uh, C2, which is a standalone unit, but now I've swapped that out and I use a FLIR that just plugs into my cell phone because now I'm, I'm part of the cell phone age these days. But as far as in hive stuff, I don't use a weight scale. I find that you can push against your hives and you can get a feel for how heavy they are or light they are unless you're doing data collection, unless you're really getting into the nitty gritty of the science and you're going to have to defend your findings. Uh, I don't think that the backyard beekeeper is really going to benefit that much other than just we want to know, you know, then what do you do with the data? Because I've had people show me all this data that they have and then what could you do with it? So all I want to know, bees alive or dead, where they're located so that I know in the wintertime whether they're going to need food or not. So that's where the thermal scan comes in. Here's the catch. I found out like the Apame hives or the Layens hives that are well insulated, it's kind of difficult to find out where your cluster is located unless you get a really, really cold day, like in the minus 20s or something like that. Then you'll see a pretty distinctive difference even through all the insulation. So there again, want to know, need to know, I don't know. But uh, that's it for my bee yard. Um, the other things are not internet dependent other than uh, we do have Arlo cameras out there. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, Arlo is sold as a security system, security camera. And I wish I had mentioned that last week because they sold those 50% off. These cameras are $199 a piece. Last week for one day, they were $65. Sorry about that. The Arlo Pro 4s. Now that's a very useful tool for me. So having them within range of my Wi-Fi, and they have their own Wi-Fi hub that comes with them, but that links into your Wi-Fi system too. So the reason I like those, and you can extend them, and I get, like you might be wondering, well, what kind of range are we talking about? We're talking about over 300 feet. But keep in mind, I live in the country. So 300 feet means trees and things like that. If you've got a bunch of parked cars, tractors, combines, heavy equipment that's made out of metal, you're going to really limit the uh, transfer capability of your data. The other thing is the frequencies you operate on. There's those 2.4 gigahertz uh, cycles that uh, extend a long way, but it seems like everything in the world interfe interferes with that frequency. So you get all these interruptions and drops and stuff like that. So if you can get a five gigahertz uh, signal out there, then fewer things are sharing the frequency. So you get a nice clean signal. Um, so you could put your security cameras, your Arlo cameras out there, and those are pulling double duty for me right now because the Arlo Pro 4, um, I did reviews of them as far as focal distance because it's interesting to me how close to that lens can I have the subject matter, honeybees in this case, and have that camera focus on it, give me a nice sharp resolution. They're 2K system. So if you need 4K, you're probably gonna need something else. But your Wi-Fi extension allows you to communicate in real time, pretty close to real time, depending on how fast your connection is. Um, you can be out of town, out of state, you can be you know, in another country and get on your phone and check in with any individual Arlo camera. So you can set them to trigger with motion detection, which in this case, most recently was the skunk situation that we're gonna talk about later today. But uh, one of the benefits of that system and having it on your Wi-Fi router and for your bee yard is that they have a spotlight function built into them. So you can have not only a camera, 
but it will have the option that when there's motion, the camera comes on, so you can leave it so that it, it doesn't alert the animal that the camera's there. So in other words, the spotlight does not come on and all you get is this infrared, so you get a grayscale view of the video, right? So the video feed that you get back is all monochromatic. Uh, the next part is you have the option to turn on this spotlight. And I don't want to give it away, but that's how we solved our skunk problem as well, is when the camera came on, the spotlight came on, and white light hits the skunk, and then, of course, it leaves. It doesn't like being lit up by spotlight. So that was built into the camera, so now it's double duty. Motion-activated light and video together. And that benefits from a really good Wi-Fi system. But as far as tech that helps your hive... Uh, expect a lot of the stuff that you put inside your hive to get propolized up. So even the ivory bee hive, which by the way is doing really well, for those of you who know that what that is, it just came out. It was made in Israel and it's a barrel shaped hive. So it's a horizontal hive and they filled almost all of their frames now. It came with the option to have temperature sensors. One would show you the outside temperature and the other sensor showed you the inside temperature. But you had to run the sensor inside where the bees have access to it. And when that happens, if you have some kind of screen or anything over it to protect these sensors, the bees propolize them up. That doesn't mean that it renders them useless or that they don't function anymore, but the bees are trying to seal it off. It's alien to a hive. You know, a lot of things are. But electronics, um, there was an article, I want to say it was bee culture, that there was an article regarding electronics inside the hive and the impact on the bees. In other words, it was affecting their behavior according to that study. And Ross Conrad, I believe, is the one that published the study. So if you want to do a Google search, Ross Conrad, electronics in your hive, I think that would be a very good place to start. If you're at all interested in finding out do the bees react to tech inside the hive or not. So for me, I've eliminated all electronic sensors inside a hive and instead I have it, for example, in the feeder shim above the inner cover and that just lets me know because if that's five degrees warmer when it's, you know, 32 degrees outside and it's warmer in the feeder shim and it's not, the sun's not shining so you get these readings at nighttime, for example, I know they're alive in there. So... It doesn't take a lot and the bees are not exposed to the tech. Plus I can service it, change a battery, do whatever I want. And I use very inexpensive temp and humidity sensors uh, that are not from Broodminder. So I need to look more into them. So maybe they'll be at the next uh, big conference in January and we can talk about their tech and see what's working and what isn't. So I hope I covered the ground on that one. Wi-Fi extenders, good. They're inexpensive. Why not get it where you need it? and uh, be able to hook up whatever you want and make your own decision about what you have inside your hive or not. Question number three comes from Jimmy from New Albany, Indiana. This is my first year using a flow hive. My questions are about preparing for winter. Do I leave the flow honey super on or remove it? Okay, so this is New Albany, Indiana. Take that flow super off. All supers, so not just the flow super, all your honey supers should be coming off um, as we get to the end of the productive year. So when they're preparing for winter and they're getting that last little bit of honey and nectar uh, together to survive winter, uh, we want to make sure that the boxes that are on and the configuration that's on, which ties into what I mentioned at the beginning, is that we want that configuration to be in place well ahead of the end of the nectar flow. That's so that your bees have plenty of time to seal up all the joints, cracks, and crevices with propolis. They will also be able to store their resources. Most of them where I live need at least 40 pounds of honey or more in some cases, depending on the size of the hive. Smaller resources for things like nucleus colonies, which are five over five over five. Those are my triples. Um, so yes, the flow super comes off. The other thing is a lot of new beekeepers are using queen excluders. There should be no queen excluder installed in your beehive when you go into winter. And the reason for that is uh, your workers are going to naturally follow the food resource up through the hive as the winter progresses. You definitely don't want them leaving your queen behind. So it puts the bees in a dilemma. They either move up and abandon the lifeblood of the hive, which is the queen, of course, and uh, she dies from exposure. She gets cold and dies. Or... 
they stay around the brood and the queen and don't migrate through your queen excluder where all the food and resources are, and then they die because they stayed with the brood and the queen. So always remove your queen excluder and always remove surplus honey supers. And the reason for that is we want to size the hive right for going through winter. Um, if you have, and for the size of the cluster, the size of the colony of bees that's occupying the hive, giving them more space is not better. And you will frequently hear that uh, the bees don't need the space. So the thinking would be they're carrying their insulation with them. This little insulated ball moves around through the hive. And that's true. However, there's secondary warmth coming off of these bees. There's heat from their bodies. There's respiration coming off of these bees. And that causes warm, moist air to move up inside the hive in the portions that that cluster is not yet occupying. So then you might think, well, then what's the problem with that? That seems like a really good thing to have. And then other people will say, aha, that's why you vent the top of your hive so that this warm, moist air vents out and does not consolidate and condense on the interior surfaces of the hive. So that's true. But if the hive is sized right, in other words, just above them, there would only be maybe one box and that's full of honey to get them through winter. Above that, having two or three supers above your cluster of bees going into winter does not benefit them. And that's because condensation will form on the surface of that stored honey that is too far away from your cluster of bees. Now, sure, as the year progresses, they'll move up more, but what happens to the condensation that's forming on these capped frames of honey? It condenses on the honey and starts to trickle down. And where does it trickle down onto? The cluster of bees and the brood that they're trying to get through winter with. So that's why we want this to be sized right. In other words, 40 or 50 pounds of honey directly over your cluster. Beyond that, take it off. And if you want to have an insurance policy on your inner cover, that's where you put your fondant. Somebody else mentioned this rapid round. They're going to have dry sugar in there. That becomes an emergency carbohydrate for the bees in the event that they consume all of the honey stores that they have. And I've been doing this for 17 winters. And uh, I can tell you that if you vent through the top, you're going to need a lot more resources. So that this is why, uh, this is why these, these arguments, these disputes come into play. Well, I've been doing this for a long time and I vent through the tops and my bees make it. And they make it on 100 pounds of honey going through winter. Okay, so my bees go through it without any venting on the top. And instead, I have insulated inner covers, insulated feeder shims, insulated outer covers, and they're going through winter on less than 45 pounds of honey. So, and they're not having condensation over the top of them, and there's no venting. So I, I want to make this really clear. If you're going to have a couple of supers above your bees, and you're going to have over 100 pounds of honey up there, you will need to vent because condensation will form when it's too far away from the cluster of bees and when it's out of the control of your bees. Okay. So sizing it right only makes sense anyway, because you want to take that honey off and you want to process that uh, in the fall instead of waiting until the following spring when it could have set or crystallized and your bees end up not using it. Insulated inner covers, 40 to 50 pounds of honey where I live, and then uh, the inner cover and so on. So yes, take your flow supers off, but I wanted to explain in more detail what the difference is and why that is. Okay, so also I don't recommend venting and having quilt boards or having Vivaldi boards or having uh, piles of pine shavings up there um, because it's unnecessary. And we don't want any condensation up there, which by the way, when that stuff gets damp, because at some point going through that filter medium, uh, if airflow is going through it, it's going to interact with the cold, it's going to reach the dew point, it's going to condense, and then your insulation starts to get wet. And what happens to wet insulation? It no longer insulates. So much better off in my opinion. If you want to try it out, do one one way and one another. See what works in your climate, and then you'll see a significant difference, both in the consumption of resources in order for your bees to get through winter, because... When we do that, what's a good analogy? 
um, I can open a window upstairs in my house in the wintertime and I won't freeze to death, right? What's going to happen? The furnace is going to kick on. The furnace is going to keep the temperature uh, where I want it. So if I need the temperature to be 75 degrees, it'll keep it at 75 degrees. Wind is open, moist air is going out. And this energy resource for your beehive is, of course, the honey, the carbohydrates. But what else is happening? Your furnace is running. What's the furnace? The furnace is the physical body of the bees, the thorax, where the muscles are that generate the heat. And so when that's happening and they're having to kick it into high gear, consuming resources, burning calories, generating the energy necessary to warm the cluster, which, of course, preserves the queen the nurse bees, those fat-bodied winter bees, and all of the resources that get your hive through winter, they're wearing themselves out. So in other words, you're reducing the life, the longevity of the bees that are having to kick in and burn like that. And I mean burn. When you see a heater bee, which is what we call them, and you do that thermal scan on the surface, you can see the thoraxes, they're, they're white, of course, on my scan because it shows by different color layers. Uh, what's generating the most heat. And they do this for 30 minutes or more at a time, and then, then they just dim out. And when they dim out, here comes another bee that's like a storekeeper bee. It could be a nurse bee. I don't know what their job is, but they bring resources to that heater bee, and they feed them through trophallaxis in place. That bee doesn't even leave where it is, because sometimes what they're doing is they're on brood on the frame Sometimes they stick their body in a cell and that heater bee generates enough heat. How many adjacent cells is it heating? Six. And then on the opposite side of the comb, it's also transmitting its warmth through there. But those bees are burning themselves out. So when you're venting and bringing in fresh air through the entrance, stale, moist air through the top, then you're also causing this furnace to function at a higher rate, consuming more resources and burning out its parts. Food for thought. So all this, because somebody asked, do I remove my flow super? When removing it, is there anything that needs to be done before storing? Yes, drain it off, of course. Take all the honey off if it's too wet. In other words, if it's uncapped, this goes for any frames that are partially capped. Um, if you have a refractometer, and I recommend that every beekeeper have one, they're very inexpensive. Know the water content of that. And if it's low enough, then you can, of course, harvest it, save it, bottle it, use it, and then uh, put it out to clean up because we're going to talk about that too. But at the end of the year, when you've harvested your honey, when you're packing down for winter, your bees are desperate for resources and they get really aggressive. They start attacking each other, robbing each other, stealing honey. And by it's a great time to put your frames that have been extracted, been drawn, out on your feeding station, I'll say it a thousand times, well away from your beehive. Uh, because I always ask a lot of questions when people have questions for me, if it's a conversation that we're having, where are you feeding? Yeah, I lean it right against my beehive. Okay, huge mistake. So please have a feeding station well away and let that be a standing station, a place that foragers can check in on to see if you've put something out there. But then it gets all cleaned up. You cycle it through your freezer if you can. And uh, that kills any wax moth uh, eggs or larvae that might be present in your beeswax. And then you go right into storage. Tupperware bins, um, hive butlers, and I also highly recommend desiccant packs. Uh, if you want to put desiccant packs in with them because that keeps condensation from forming while they're in storage. Because I don't know where you're storing them. If it's in your basement or someplace that's climate controlled, you probably don't need that. If it's in a garage or a shed or something like that, then we get those thermal exchanges, you know, hot and cold, and you have condensation forming, and you get a lot of wax bloom. I don't know if you know what that is. When you look at your beeswax on your frames, it looks really nice and clean when you first put it in there, after, especially after the bees have all cleaned it up. And then sometimes you'll notice it has kind of a chalky look on the outside of it. And some people have written to me or sent pictures and said, uh, wow, my, my frames have mold all over them. The wax has mold all over it. No, that's just bloom. So it's kind of like an oxidation that occurs on the surface of your beeswax. When you uh, have desiccant packs and things like that in it, Wise Dry is just one brand that I recommend because they're rechargeable. You use them over and over. Um, when you put those in there, condensation doesn't form on the beeswax. And by the way, by the way your beeswax is not ruined. 
uh, you can just hit it with a hair dryer or something like that and it just reconstitutes it. It's like really, it's really easy. But either way, you can keep your condensation from forming on your sword frames. So I think that's about it. I'm a fan of um, totes for backyard beekeepers because we don't deal with thousands of hives the way commercial people do. Commercial people can have a room for that stuff with racks and they can dehydrate and dehumidify and have air blowing. And because little fans and things like that, why would they leave that blowing on their, their um, frames that are still in the boxes? Because remember, I take my frames out of the boxes I don't store them because wintertime is a time when we can refurbish our bee boxes. So to do that, we have to have the frames out. That's why I use hive butlers. Okay, moving on. Question number four. James from Sydney, New South Wales, Australia. Is it possible to build a bivouac point? This is a good question. What should it be built out of? Or would a swarm trap hive be sufficient? It might make it easier to capture a swarm from my hives. I've had them swarm to the top of a bamboo mini forest before that swarm got away. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, this is something that I do because I like to entertain myself like that. And I like to encourage the bees. A bivouac, first of all, um, is a good term for a lot of backyard beekeepers to know. Uh, because a lot of people misunderstand that a bivouac is not a final destination. So a bivouac, just like, you know, if, if we were all hiking somewhere and we say, oh, we're going to bivouac here for the night, and everybody pitches their tents and they hang their hammocks up in the trees because they don't want ants to get them overnight and things like that. Your bees bivouac when they swarm. So in other words, when they leave the hive that they're departing, they don't go directly to their final destination. They'll hang out on a tree branch or on a fence post or something like that. That's the bivouac. And that's where you get the Facebook posts and they, people are writing to each other. I have a swarm of bees in my yard. What can I do? And we all know that that's a temporary location most of the time. So this bivouac location is something that I like to control. I want to get my bees to land where I want them to land. So we're going to manipulate our bees. What is the number one thing that drives them when they're going from one location to another? Pheromones. So this is something interesting. And if you've kept bees for a while, you'll notice that the same trees get used over and over again for this bivouac location. How far from the hive that they've departed from do they normally bivouac? Within 150 feet. And that's statistics, right? So of course you can get, there are bees that come out and bivouac right on the side of the hive they just left. It's really interesting. Uh, so anyway, with, I've noticed here where I am that they're bivouacking within 50 feet of the hives that they leave. And they go to the same trees. And early in the year, this is where it's a political game, right? So we're trying to win over where their scouts are going to dictate that they temporarily land. A lot of us think the queen is in charge. So when the queen flies out, when they're leaving the hive and they're going to produce a new superorganism, Wherever she goes, they go. It's kind of not like that. The queen is really following this swarm. So where they start to collect on a tree branch, they encourage the queen to land there. Sometimes the queen doesn't. Sometimes she lands temporarily or moves back and goes back into the hive altogether. And that's where you see a, a cluster onto a tree branch, but they don't appear settled. They're moving all over it. They're searching everywhere. What are they searching for? They're searching for the queen who should be with them. If she's not, they move back to the hive that they came out of. So, but what we notice is when they do settle on a branch, when they do cluster up, while the scouts continue to look for their final destination, uh, they leave pheromones all over the branch. In fact, if they're there for a couple of days, you'll even see little bits of beeswax on the branch that they landed on. And, the, and when they do that, uh, it leaves a pheromone trail. So now, often when there's swarming activity in your apiary, more than one colony tends to swarm within a couple of days of each other, if not even on the same day, if not even just within hours of each other. That's why you can get multiple swarms on the same tree on different branches, for example. Now, when that pheromone is on that tree branch and they've embedded their beeswax especially, that leaves this pheromone trail. Now, who knows why other clusters form and make a bivouac there? It may be that because that, that is there, 
uh, that it might be deemed a safe place for the bees. In other words, they smell it, other queens were there, and it's the queen pheromone that is the strongest. So QMP, which is a queen mandibular pheromone, which is passed physically from bee to bee within the same hive, and then they can also mark surfaces with it. So anyway, once they're on that spot, they use that spot over and over again. So here is why what I do, I'm going to get to, there is another lure system that I'll talk about. I don't think it's very effective, but I'm explaining the principle behind why they collect, where they collect. And if it's 14, 15 feet in a tree, that's tougher to get. So I've used QMP, queen mandibular pheromone, but it's a synthetic QMP. It's called temp queen. Now, it's sold through a lot of bee supplies. I get mine through Better Bee. It's like $5 for two of them. It's a little translucent green noodle that comes with its own zip tie. You zip tie that to a tree branch. Now, that's not the intent of it. It's designed to be used. You find out that you are uh, queenless in a colony and you don't want your bees to start having laying workers. So you put temp queen a temporary queen pheromone, which fools them into thinking there is a queen present, even though they can't find her. And then that pheromone inside the hive prevents them from producing another queen and starting queen cells and things like that. It also prevents them from uh, activating their ovaries. So the workers then do not become laying workers, generally three weeks after the queen is absent. So here's the thing. Temp queen is what I do to establish my bivouac points. And I picked uh, two or three different locations early in the year, and I put them on and I leave them on. And then, wouldn't you know it, a swarm shows up there. Now, this does create a dilemma, because sometimes you look out there and there'll be a baseball or softball-sized uh, cluster of bees on that tree branch. There's no queen. Uh, so this is what led me down the line of learning that, well, they just follow these pheromones, even though that's not their own queen. This is not a recognition of their own colony being bivouacked. And that's why sometimes when bees do temporarily cluster on a tree branch, if they have a mated queen, which usually they do, because that's the oldest queen, she's leaving the hive. And uh, when they cluster there, this pheromone goes out in the air because they're also fanning their off glands. Why are they doing that? Because they've left the colony that they resided in, and now they're temporarily clustering on this branch. So they put out this signal through pheromone to all of their hive mates that were over here. So when the bees are flying around and they fly through that pheromone stream, they come to that location and they cluster and they join that cluster. This is why sometimes this bivouac actually grows beyond the size of the actual number of bees that departed the hive. So if you've got a lot of other bees and colonies nearby, chances are you're going to gain weight beyond the number of bees that left because random bees are flying through the pheromone stream shifting route and joining them there. It's really interesting stuff. Okay, so the QMP, and then of course this time of year, I don't have that on any branches because what I end up with is a bunch of orphaned bees that start to cluster that have no queen, and uh, then we're kind of in a pickle. So I've stopped that, but here's what happens. Even after I take the QMP noodle away, they go to the same branch over and over again. And why is that? Because now the pheromones are so strong in the bark, in the pulpy wood, and it's always a branch that should be capable of supporting five pounds of bees, four pounds of bees. So don't pick a little mamby pamby branch that, you know, goes down like Charlie Brown's Christmas tree. Pick a really strong branch that's in a somewhat sheltered location and accessible to you. So eye level, it's perfect. It's great for videos and everything else. That's why I like it. Now, another way that people are building bivouac points, and I have to be honest and say I've never tried it. So I'm not saying it doesn't work. It doesn't feel like it would work. Plus, I don't want something hanging around that looks like it. But it's called a Russian scion. And depending on where you live, it might be a scene or a scion. But anyway, um, all it is is taking pieces of uh, screen and wood and they're painting it up with uh, beeswax or they're impregnating the screen with beeswax and they're making it smell like bees have been there. And then they hang it out and then they're hoping that when your bees go to bivouac, they'll go to that. Um, I just did a cursory check of that after I got this question, and I haven't found anyone who's showing that that scion, the Russian scion, is effective or that it works. 
The other thing is aesthetically, it doesn't look too good to me. I mean, I'm not criticizing, but I'm just saying I don't need uh, parts of trash cans and stuff hanging from trees, hoping that my bees will collect on it. So if you're one of the people who's tried it and it worked for you, I hope you'll make a video and show how well it worked. Because I'm gonna suggest something else. Um, you want the stuff that your bees have interacted with, you want the stuff that your bees have impregnated their scent with. And so we're talking about, we do all these scrapings, we get propolis, we get everything off of our hives when we're inspecting or scraping the backs of the hive uh, frames and things like that. And we're collecting propolis and we're collecting all this great smelling stuff. I would say find a way with the lowest temperature possible. You do not want to overheat that stuff. Get it just to its melting point where it's workable. And I would glom that stuff onto a tree branch that's already part of a tree. I don't see any reason to make a separate gizmo for that. Um, your, your goal is to get that scent of that queen. So if you don't want to spend $5 and get QMP to establish that scent, um, propolis, beeswax, all the other stuff that you can get together and then kind of make a slurry with it and uh, stick it right on that tree branch, I think would be a great idea to make it smell good. But if you have honey in it and things like that, it's going to be attractive to bees and other insects that aren't necessarily going to treat it as a bivouac. So the queen pheromone is the strongest incentive for the bees to go and collect on a given branch. So, uh, should it be built out of? Okay, so what should it be built out of? Tree branches, things that are already there. I wouldn't try to add something. I think we're much better off um, utilizing a branch that's already there, a configuration that already exists in nature, and then adding that scent to it. And it should be kind of sheltered and kind of look at what your bees are already using. Um, swarm trap hive, would that be sufficient? So those are two completely different functions. So if we have a hive that's set up to trap the swarm, that's a final destination. The bivouac is intermediate. So if we set up a, as I have right now, I have two hives that are out right now. One is a nucleus sized hive. The other is a 10 frame single deep with a bunch of frames in it, no honey but it does have all of the signals within it, the scent signals that tell bees that this has been occupied before. So if I get one of those weird late season swarms, I would really like it to just hive itself for me. And that's happened this year where I got to video it. They, you know, they, they left their bivouac location and went right into one of my hives. So that is possible. But swarm traps and hives that you're hoping to have your bees voluntarily move into are different from this intermediate establishment of a bivouac location. So, what else did I put in my notes down here? Put it where you can check it frequently because this year uh, my bivouac locations have been occupied for as short as an hour or two in a lot of cases. Um, so I've had them, while I'm explaining what a bivouac is as I am to you right now, I've been outside and walked, oh, here they are, they're, you know, they're bivouac here and as soon as you guys leave, we're gonna, we're gonna bag this swarm of bees. And then while I'm talking to them, they take off. So uh, have it in a place where you can notice it frequently. If you have grandkids, make that part of their daily routine. Hey, go check for swarms and come back and tell me what's going on. I happen to benefit from those little eagle eyes that run around and tell me when there's a swarm. I used to not believe them. They say, grandfather, there's a swarm out here. I say, okay, they're just doing orientation flights and stuff. No, they're different. And then you go out there and sure enough, there's a swarm. So have it where you can see them, where you know what's going on. And I hear them before I see them. So that's interesting too. Uh, that's it for James, New South Wales. Question number five comes from David from Amarillo, Texas. As my wife and I begin extracting uh, spring 2023 honey, we are keeping trap, uh, we're keeping track of the moisture content of each bucket. Good news for you that you have buckets of honey. We had a very wet spring, so there was lots of forage for the bees, and we've never gotten this much honey in six years of beekeeping. I find that the moisture varies from 16 to 18 percent, so I'm being selective in who we give different batches to. People we know will eat it immediately and want more. Those folks We'll get the 18%. 
Some of our family and friends take forever to consume one jar of honey, so they get the drier 16%, and uh, because I think it has a longer shelf life. My question came from my wife, actually. Are we making too big a deal out of the moisture content? Can't we just give the honey away without paying attention to who gets what moisture content? Okay. Yes, if you are hovering between 16 and 18%, that is all stable. So I would not even worry about that. There are people that run around with jars with 19% honey, even 20% honey. And one of the things, uh, the people that I go to for stuff like this are people that are responsible for food quality, food stability. Uh, the Department of Agriculture, for example, has inspectors. When you are a commercial honey producer... And this comes into play state by state. You know, there are regulations for your honey nationally. There's the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, things change if your honey is a component to another food. That's interesting. But if you're just collecting honey and selling honey direct from you to the consumer, the rules are very relaxed. So it's completely up to you um, to make sure to meet those requirements. So anything 18% or lower, you can have honey that's too dry. Did you know? If you talk to these inspectors, 14% is the minimum moisture content your honey has to have. They said it's too dry after that. So I don't even know what that means. If it's too dry, what happens to it? I don't know. But talk to these inspectors is pretty interesting. Of course, they're all following government procedures, government uh, analysis requirements, and things like that. They have categories for raw honey as well. So uh, from 14 to 20%, so they grade it. There's a grade C that's actually at 20%. That would be the one that you want to give to the people that are going to drink, eat it right away or consume it right away. Those are your frequent flyers. So people that come get the honey and they're getting a new jar every two weeks or something like that, give them your 20%. But if you're at 18% or lower, I think you're absolutely good to go. And again, I'm getting this information from uh, the inspectors, people that are responsible for making sure that the food is stable. So, um, yeah, 16%, that's good too, because as I said, the lower threshold for your honey moisture content is 14%. So, And so there are people that are honey judges and things like that, uh, which may have something to say. But so food stability and suitability for consumption for people is one thing. Honey, that looks fantastic. That's going to win awards for you. Uh, that's another group of people. But uh, yes, to answer your question, uh, you are overthinking it and you're being a little too concerned. 18% is great. So anything 19 or over could ferment. Uh, over 20% will ferment for sure. Don't have anything. I would even play with that 20% mark. Because you can have, and of course this doesn't apply because you're doing the 18% here. But for those that are listening, if you're hovering around 20%, I get that honey into my dehumidifier, which for me is my Vivo Sun, which is at the opposite end of the room I'm in right now, just 30 feet away. And uh, that's what I put uh, on a rack and it gets fans blown on it and I can reduce that one percentage uh, every 24 hours just through fans and uh, roughly 85 to 90 degree temperature in there which is just the temperature that accumulates from the fans running and from the motor that's on the dehumidifier that runs in there so then when i get it at 18 or lower i'm done it's good so if you had 20 percent honey in there two days later you're at 18 percent and those things are very inexpensive by the way the vivo sun uh, little tents. They're actually grow tents, but it's a great controlled environment for you. Keeps dust and everything out of there too because they keep it zipped up and closed all the time. And your dehumidifier, for example, has a filter system in it. So it's cleaning the air the whole time. So when you put your honey in there for dehumidification, and by the way, it can be in the jars. You can go ahead and pour all the honey into all your quart jars. Because here's the other thing. Um, let's say you had 20 or even 21% honey because at the end of the year, sometimes people pull uncapped honey uh, just because they have to get it out. Uh, they don't want to leave it in the hive or at the end of the year, we're packing down for winter. So leaving it in the jars and setting your jars on racks. And by that, I mean, there are these rolling carts. Again, they're very inexpensive. They have steel wiring on them. So air flows through them all. And then all of your little fans just aim at the surface of that. 
Remember that honey is hygroscopic. And by that, I mean it, it stabilizes. In other words, it'll take on moisture. It will also stabilize itself. So if you're hitting the surface of it and you're just evaporating moisture that way, it's not like you're only evaporating the moisture from the top of the honey. It draws that. So wherever the, the wetter honey is in that jar, it's going to uh, normalize or stabilize throughout the jar of honey. So when you take your samples, you're going to use a little pipette and draw it from the bottom if you want to. And you're going to find out it's consistent throughout the whole jar of honey. So easy to do, something backyard beekeepers can do. And congratulations on having such good honey year. By the way, a lot of people are reporting very good honey years. Some people have kept bees and not had honey ever. Never had surplus honey are getting surplus honey this year in my neck of the woods. So I hope it is the same for you. Question number six, Jonathan from Pipe Creek, Texas. Oh, this is a good one. This is not so much a question. This is a shout out to Jonathan. So I'm going to give you a link for question number six. Um, it says, here's a video of a long Langstroth hive I made. It was inspired by Dr. Leo. Dr. Leo, for those of you who don't know, horizontalhive.com. And I saw him on your channel and I used his dimensions partly. Also, horizontalbees.com that gave Cayman a hive also inspired me. And then it just says, take care. So I looked at the YouTube and I thought it was really cool because uh, when it comes to horizontal hives in particular, there are so many different variations in what you do. And he did some interesting things in there. Like he has, rather than describe all of it, but I'm he's my shout out for today. That video, uh, the channel is called Deep Roots. So that's the, that's the YouTube channel name. And uh, the title of the video is Long Lang Mods. So I'm going to link that. I hope you'll go there. Small channel, obviously a craftsman, doing a great job innovating thinking on the fly and coming up with ways to make a hive that suits the bees in the climate in which he's keeping them. So there are a lot of interesting um, ways that he's going about managing his bees. And uh, so I'm going to ask you please to go visit that channel, say hello, make some comments maybe about the hive, maybe you've got some ideas. I think it's fantastic when people just take the principles of beekeeping and uh, install into a hive that you're building yourself uh, different attributes and capabilities that you want to have in the way you personally manage your bees. So pop in and take a look. I think that's it. That was the last question for today. So we're in the fluff section and I hope you will go to that channel. We need to support other beekeepers as much as possible, especially innovators, people that are doing stuff. So the fluff section today, you might be wondering about the cover photo. Why? You, you didn't even talk about that yet. So I am going to talk about that right now because I'm going to talk about new frames. A lot of people um, want to know about the end of the year when they pull honey off and they want to put new frames in or maybe they want to super up because they suddenly realize their colonies are almost full and they want to add frames. This time of year, as you get to the end of the productive year for your beehives, they are not prone to use frames. They're only having a foundation. So in other words, what's that look like? Wooden frame. This particular one ha has a plastic foundation. This is acorn foundation and it's heavy wax. This time of year, would I put this in one of my beehives? I would not. And the reason is, uh, it already has to have wax drawn on it if you want them to use it right now. Also, if you're trying to avoid those late season swarms because they can get honey bound as the nectar flow continues and they're bringing in everything because there's a lot of bearding going on on all my hives right now. Uh, there's a lot of nectar coming in. You can smell it in the air. And if you want to get them to utilize new frames, put in frames that are already drawn out and you may not have frames that are already drawn out. So what could you do if you're a new beekeeper? And I realize this is short fusing because um, a lot of you would not have this, but and this is a deep, but there are also medium frames of this. This is better comb. 
This is one of those things that people have a lot of opinions about. Better comb looks like drawn beeswax. It is a synthetic, but it is made by biochemists who matched the formula of actual beeswax as much as they could. Deep, medium frames. Late in the year, if you want to put something in the hives that the bees will immediately start to clean up and store honey in, but yet not use their valuable resources to draw out your cells, better comb, which comes from better bee. So you can go for that. And this serves as a placeholder because it's the other thing. We don't want to put a whole super on right now. You sh your super should already be in place. So what you want to do is, as you do your inspections, as my grandson and I did just uh, yesterday, in fact, when we look at the frames and we find that they're full of honey, you pull the center couple of frames out. And while you're there, don't do it to where you have to go extract and come back. Bring frames with you. So a medium super, pull the frame out, put one of these right in its place right away. And the ones that we want them to work right away, that we want them to put the honey in, of course, those should be in the center because that's going to be the warmest. Because what's happening next week, we're dropping into the 60s. Frames that are in the center of your supers, you checkerboard them. So pull every other frame. That saves us from having to put a whole super on right now, which, by the way, they may not even touch this time of year. So pull the frames, put them in your tote, your hive butler, whatever you have, and uh, replace them all in one fell swoop. Write it in your notes so you know which ones that you did because we've got plenty of time now for them to draw that out. Someone else wrote and asked me about Layens hives. How do we feed them in winter? Well, so the interesting part of that is Dr. Leo doesn't want you to feed them. Dr. Leo, horizontalbees.com, wants you to uh, have a survival of the fittest, live and let live uh, method of keeping your bees. So the way the lay-ins frames are, and that was what was in the cover in the thumbnail for today, the backs of these frames come together, they form a cover board. They are up against one another and they prevent feeding through the top of the horizontal lay-ins hive. Interestingly enough, Dr. Leo will sell you a frame feeder. Even though he would much rather you did not feed your bees, you want to see if they make it or not, but just in case you want to feed them, there is a land size frame feeder. Notice this one is still in brand new condition because I haven't used it. I have two lands hives out there, so I'm no lands expert, but they are really strong, doing extremely well. I've not fed them. But if you want to do it, then put one of these feeders in. Where would it go? You want to, of course, have your frames of uh, honey in there. And then, of course, at the end of that, so brood, 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 brood mix with honey and uh, bee bread. Then you put your frame probably two-thirds of the way across your lands. And then you could have sugar in here if you wanted to. And you would not be putting syrup in at the end of the year as things are getting colder. Another thing I wanted to talk about, the starter strip. So... We had discussions about that this earlier this year, and we were using these full frames of this very expensive beeswax foundation, which comes from Spain and sold through horizontalhive.com. And we decided to save resources that we would cut it off and just have starter strips. So you could get three of these out of one sheet. And the goal was to keep this from sagging because some of them did sag at the bottom. So by putting starter strips on, we eliminated the sagging. But what I want to talk to you about is what happened was <clears throat> they did worker cells all the way through here. But when they got down here, they built out uh, drone cells, which I found interesting. Now, that doesn't matter if they make drone cells, if this is going to be a honey frame, and that's fine. But worker frames, that didn't work out too well. So that's just one of the things that's going to happen. Often, if you use uh, starter strips instead of going the full 
way down or leaving it as a foundationless frame. So that's going to be it for today. Uh, I did notice that the bees now are interested in salt water. So the demand for salt water is really up and they're using um, sea salts at one teaspoon per quart of fresh water. And they're going after that. And I don't understand how they use it. I don't understand how that has anything to do. Somebody said they use it to cure or dry their honey. I couldn't find anything about that. If you know about that, please send me a link to the study or the chemistry involved in that. I would really like to know. But their demand for mineral water, sea salts, things like that is really up right now. And uh, of course, the nectar flow is on strong and they're doing fantastic. So that's it. I want to thank you for your time today and stay tuned if you're interested. After the credits at the end here, uh, my grandson is back. He's going to give you a recap of how we outwitted the skunk, how the bees are safe now, and how we found another problem that we're going to deal with next year. So watch the official junior beekeeper coming right up. And for the rest of you, have a fantastic weekend. Thanks for listening, and I hope your bees are fantastic right now. Thanks for watching. Um, last week we had um, a problem with the um, beehive. Um, it was um, lower than 18 inches, so we had to raise it up so the skunks um, stopped eating um, the bees. Um, we raised it up, we helped the bees, and no more skunks are eating the beehives anymore. Um, over here. Right here. Here is the beehive. We got. I'm happy they are um, going, working. No more skunks are eating. Spot as the. So did it work? Yes, it worked. How do we know that it worked? Um, because we got video footage right here. We have video. Oh, we do have a camera right there. So you think we should show them some sequences of the skunk not eating the bees anymore? Yeah, yeah we should. All right, let's do that for a second.
Okay, so raising the hive actually worked, and that was a great idea, and I'm glad that we got the bees off the ground. The next thing we did was what? We had to walk around and look at other beehives. What do you notice? Um, if we walk around, you, um, this beehive right here, um, look, look at the bright yellow. Some bees don't have it, but some bees do. That is pollen that are bringing in pollen a bunch, but if you look at some other hives, you won't, um, you won't see that much pollen coming in. So this one's got plenty of pollen, you're saying? It's not, yeah, it's bringing them pollen. They're, bring, they're, bringing them, they're bringing them pollen, but not as much as that we have over there. So why do we care about them bringing in pollen? Um, so, so um, because that will feed the babies. And um, so lots, lots of these um, beehives are doing great. Bring in pollen. That's good. Um, but when we looked over to um, a different hive in the second bee yard, we found a um, problem with the bees. So there is no, there is no um, pollen coming in, coming in. Just bees coming in. You see no pollen, and they and there isn't too many bees coming in. Why do they need pollen? Huh? Why do they need pollen? And they need pollen to feed their babies. Feed their babies. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we see lots of pollen coming in, mm -hmm. we think. They've got uh, developing brood in there that they're feeding? Yeah. Okay. And uh, I noticed too that you're wearing a different outfit today in the bee yard. Right. And before you had a full bee suit on. Uh -huh. How can we not wear a bee suit today? Because um, we're not opening in a hive. Because we're not opening hives. So we're pretty much, we're okay being around the beehives. Yeah. But people should know how to be safe around bees, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. When they're in a beehive. Don't, yeah, don't stand directly in front, stand beside like me. Okay, that sounds good. Mm -hmm. And this colony is doing great, you said? Mm -hmm. And so if kids like to count, you know, 60 yeah. seconds, they should see at least 10 loads of pollen. And that's really happening here, right? Yeah, that's one, two, three. So let's go down four. below. Yeah, how many are you counting right now? I count four, five, six, um, six, seven, eight. Nine, ten, eleven. So more than you could count almost. Yeah. Okay. So we found one that wasn't doing so well, right? You yeah. want to show us that hive? One. Okay. Right now we're in our lower bee yard. Um, over here. Is today a good day for looking in beehives? Nope. I look know. up at the sky, it is cloudy. Oh yeah, that's not good. Oh, um our hives doing So is this hive good. okay? Oh my god, yes, they are doing really good. They are bearding. So they're bearding, why do they do that? Um because they have too much honey in their hive. They um, try to fan it off. Bearding is, a, is not a bad thing. And um, mm -hmm. it, it looks like they're bringing them pollen out. It doesn't look like they're bringing in too much because they have a lot of honey um, in the hive. Um, they're fanning it off. Can you it. smell anything? Oh, I can, yeah, I can smell a lot of honey. Guys. It smells like honey, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So we're in a nectar flow right now, which is really good for the bees. Why do they collect nectar? What are they doing with it? Um, nectar, um, they, they chew nectar off to make honey. So we hear a lot of air moving out of that hive. What's that about? Um, they are fanning. That, um, they are fanning the um, dry some of the honey. So they're drying down the honey. Okay, let's go look at the problem hive. Okay, so this hive is good. This hive is good. That hive is good. When you say that hive is good, what does that mean? Let's go over here and look at this one. Okay. Now this is smaller than other hives. Yeah. Why is that? Um, because it is a nucleus 
nucleus hive. A nucleus hive. Mm -hmm. So we use that to start, start small colonies? Yeah. So they have a lot of work ahead of them, right? Mm -hmm. And we need to see a lot of activity and we need to see pollen coming in. And if we don't have pollen, was there a problem with one of these hives? Yeah. Let's go see what that was. It was this hive right here. And they were bringing in no pollen. We opened the beehive up. We saw no eggs, no queen, and um, no, no queen, no eggs. No, no almost no activity. Yeah, and oh, no. Oh, there's one little bee. Yeah, um, no, no, um, honey, no pollen. So <laughs> then, what can we do about that? If they don't, they have some honey, right? But no pollen's a big deal this time of year. Mm -hmm. So, so what can we do about it? Um, so we went to um, a different hive over there and we um, opened it up, found three frames with honey. We made, we made, made sure we didn't take the queen on the three um, frames, but yeah, so we found three frames with a bunch of bees, um, honey, larva, and babies. And if they feed the queen enough and some food, they and it will turn into a queen, and this hive will be. So gone. they could make a new queen because we gave them eggs, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But uh, that takes a long time. Mm -hmm. What's an what's something else that we could do to help this colony out this time of year? Um, we could give them honey or a queen. We could get them a queen, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So if we got a queen and put her in here, she's laying already, does that save them a lot of time? Yeah. It does? Okay. So what do you think next week that we should show people how we install a queen and salvage a colony that's queenless? Yeah. Right? Because mm -hmm. if they're queenless, what happens to the bees that are in there? Um, um, they, um, they will stay in the hive and they could die from... They could die because there's no new bees. Right, so they just live so many weeks, and then that's it, and then we lose the colony. Mm -hmm. no, so, no, no. so was that a good decision to keep them around and put a new queen in, or should we have waited and just let them make a new one from the eggs we put in? Um, I think we should get a new queen in. Yeah, you're right, because it's already August, mm -hmm. and it would be a month from now before mm -hmm. new bees would be coming out. Okay. So in the meantime, all the bees in this colony would just be dying out. Right? Mm -hmm. Of old age. It's not like they're suffering. Yeah, right? just you only have six weeks to live per bee. Yeah, so adding in the new queen next week, we're going to see how that goes. You did a great job describing all the mm -hmm. frames that we put in there. And do we take those from a small hive or a big hive? A big hive. A big hive. Because if we're going to take those resources, important to have a big colony that has lots to share, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to salvage this colony. All right. Okay, that bee. Now that bee just flew out with a dead bee. That is not good. It isn't? What's happening? It's trying to find a spot to put the dead bee. Okay, why do they do that? Um, Any idea? No. Why would a bee take a dead bee out? Um, we have a name for those bees. Um, so they um, don't take up room in the hive. <laughs> it's so they don't die in the hive. Mm-hmm. And so they keep the hive clean and free of dead bees. That's called an undertaker bee. Mm. So next week we are going to um, update you guys about um, when we put the queen in. And this is the way to be. <laughs> okay, so I hope you enjoyed. Um, take care of your bees. Um, I hope you learned something new. And this is the way to be. Okay. Okay, we got one. Wait, we should get one little pollen right now. It's so not as well as some of the other hives, right? Oh. But we still think there's a queen in there. Mm hmm. Because if they're bringing in pollen, they are living, they're doing pretty good. Um, I think they have a queen, but I do not know what that bee is doing for some reason. It's just like hot. Okay, now it's gone. You just went into the hot. Well, that's one thing, too. Let's just look at them and see if we understand all the things that they're doing on their landing board, right? Mm-hmm. And I see some dirt on this landing board. 
What's that from? Skunks. Yeah, skunk in the past. But then we raised it up more. So mm -hmm. this one's high enough too, and we don't have any more skunk problems here. Alright. That's good news. Mm -hmm. You want to look at some other hives? Oh uh, yeah, sure. Okay. So this is the hive we took the um, frames from because they were doing really well. You can see they are bringing in lot. You can see them bringing in pollen. We opened the hive and they had hundreds of thousands of bees with. Hundreds of thousands? That's a lot. I mean, tens of thousands, I meant. Well, yeah, we had easily, all the frames are full in here, right? Yeah. So full of honey, yeah. bees, larvae. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when, yeah when, and when we took the frames from here, the bees stayed on when we um, put um, put them in that hive, so we, um, so we got more bees, too. Well, that's really good that you remembered mm -hmm. that uh, they stayed on the frames. What was the difference? So mm -hmm. when we pulled the frames of mm -hmm. brood out, we waited for a little bit mm -hmm. before we loaded them up to yeah. take them with us. Why was that? Um, so they, um, I forgot. Yeah, we mm -hmm. only wanted nurse bees to go with us. Uh -huh. So we let those that are older, that are foragers, they would mm -hmm. go off the frames and go back into the hive. Mm -hmm. So we give them a few minutes to do that. And then that way the bees that we took down to combine there mm -hmm. uh, would stay with that nucleus hive, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And they were a little bit uh, defensive there when we did that, right? Mm -hmm. That's because when you get into those parts of the hive, it doesn't make the bees very happy, does it? No. Nope. I think it's something trying to steal, um, steal from them, kind yeah. of. Yeah. And it was something stealing from them. Yeah. Us. <laughs> so. All right, that's a good explanation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pull from a strong colony, and mm -hmm. then we'll get them a new queen next week. Mm -hmm. So thanks for that. You did a great job, queen. Mm -hmm. Okay.